My name is Donna Jones. This is a From Insight to Action program and today I've got the pleasure of talking to Judith Glazer who is the author of Conversational Intelligence. Now one of the things we're doing in these programs is, is really exploring ways in which companies can walk in and into the whole arc of, of culture change. How can we change our companies so that, and our cultures so that they function better in high-speed change. There's some agility built in and people, it's great places for people to work as well and contribute and make a difference. So, so part of that is in how conversations happen. And so Judith, I came across Judith through the World Business Executive Coaching Summit and I am delighted to have her because she has been studying the whole field of conversations and neuroscience, that intersection and neurochemistry since she was 14, which I think is incredibly ambitious. <laughs> an organizational anthropologist and she's obviously the leading expert on conversational intelligence. So she's got published uh, blogs in, in um, um, HBR and in Psychology Today, so lots of material out there, lots of ways in which you can explore further. Uh, Judith, let's turn it over to you and start off by learning what conversational intelligence is and why it matters to business right now. It's uh, that's a, the big big question, the eighty four million dollar question, um, which I love to think about every day. Even though uh, I think that there's some simple definitions which I'll share, the broadness of application of this work is astounding me every day when I think about it and engage with new people. Uh, change, changing organizations is one of the big areas that I specialize in as well, and I love to work on. And you mentioned the word agility, and I hope we can come back to that. But conversational intelligence, um, unlike emotional intelligence. And unlike intellectual intelligence where people get high scores for this and low scores, it's my belief that every human being is hardwired with conversational intelligence capabilities. It's, it's part of what it means to be human. Uh, we have genes that work inside of us that a lot of people don't know about. The FOXP2 gene, for example, which is a language gene that animals don't have. So as soon as we went through that evolutionary transformation from animal to human, the biggest characteristics were around language. And our genetic structure not only gives us the gene, the FOXP2 gene, but it also enables the genes that we have that are called transcription genes, which are to be impacted by the environment. That means genes that are designed so that when you and I are engaging with each other, you're actually impacting me in some way. Like, no, you're not you know, changing my body shape. <laughs> we go to doctors for that. But, <laughs> but it's about impacting each other. So come, the broader definition is that everybody has, is hardwired for conversational intelligence. It's something that's hidden from sight, but the study of it that brings it out helps us connect, navigate, and grow with other human beings. That's what the conversational platform is for, to connect, to navigate, and to grow with other human beings. Does Which that make sense? Yeah, totally. It may, and it, it, it actually bridges in the whole business of the workplace environment as being a critical factor for shaping what happens because those transcription genes, um, that's where, where the conversation takes place, at least biologically, shall we say. So, exactly. You've, you've, actually, you've actually pinpointed why we have to think differently in the modern world today about what leadership is and about what change is because it, we're already imbued with those um, capabilities and those instincts. And now we have to learn how to shape the environment so that we can bring out the best of what those instincts are all about. And it's a different way of thinking for some leaders. Leaders were taught that they need to be strong and powerful and authoritative, the, the power model. And in fact, it's not as much about that as it is creating environments to help shape the culture that will then lead to the kind of environment that we want to create in the world for success. Yeah, exactly. So now this is where the, com the bit about trust comes in and, and probably innovation because you obviously in a fearful environment cannot innovate. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not going to happen. What, why is this important? Why is the understanding of conversational intelligence important to business now? Um, and specifically because the world is changing so rapidly. Change was something that we used to have to do. We had to move a company forward by changing it. That we, if we keep our sights outside on the world and the marketplace, the change is happening so rapidly that our job is to be agile and to respond to the change and to learn from it. And so conversational intelligence, shaping the right environments for safe, healthy conversations is the pivotal distinction between successful companies and successful leaders and those that are not. I, I can't put enough emphasis on that. Being able to move agilely through conversations, not be stuck on them, uh, 
and we, we need to go into the neuroscience behind this, but having that agility to move through those difficult conversations with people and not avoid them is what enables a company to grow from where they are now to whatever their next important um, levels or benchmarks are. Okay, well, can we take a look at the neuroscience then and get into what the levels are of conversation so that, that someone watching this can go, oh, I'm at a level one, two, or occasionally a three, or just get yep. some kind of map there. Yep, so you want me to go to my slides? Yeah, I think that would be great. If, if okay. Um, okay, let me let me take care of this. Hang on a second. We, we have fun with this process of switching slides over, so. Yeah, let's see if we can get it to work. So tell me if... Is it on for slides? Yep, she's got it. Here we go. Okay. Um, let me let me get my first slide up then, and uh, and stop mm -hmm. me if you want to ask some questions too, because I want to be as responsive as possible to uh, to your thinking. Um, but conversational intelligence is all about how great leaders build trust and get extraordinary results. Um, what was fascinating is the book, I proposed the book many times to publishers and this is my seventh book but this book got rejected a hundred times and um, when it finally was accepted um, it was going into a second printing after two months. So it's clearly the right time, right place story. Um, conversational intelligence, this is such a great quote from the Pentagon which is, I know that you believe, you understand what you think I said but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. So as we've been talking about, conversations are more than just sharing of information. Um, there's a whole worldview that we all carry around with us uh, about what it means, what we're thinking, and how we share what we're thinking with others. Um, the key behind conversational intelligence is that to get to the next level of greatness as human beings, as teams, as organization, it depends on the quality of the culture, which depends on the quality of relationships, which depends on the quality of conversations. Everything happens through conversation. It's where it begins and where it ends. And where trust fits in is that we can't have healthy conversations without a foundation of trust. Uh, conversational intelligence, as we said, is the hardwired and learnable ability to connect, navigate, and grow with others, a necessity in building healthier and more resilient organizations in the face of change. And conversation in all intelligence begins with elevating the levels, levels of trust that you create with others and ends with the quality of interactions and conversations that result. So um, what's different about conversational intelligence? You asked about the levels. It turns out that human beings are not just sharing information. We're actually moving through three levels of connection with human beings in order to get to the place where we're being transformational or where we're able to shape the environment around us. Um, let me explain. Level one is, is transactions, where we are um, at a lower level of conversation with people. It's a lot of asking and telling or confirming what we know. Uh, level two is positional, where we are feeling strong about a point of view and we have to defend what we know, or where we're in decision making and there are many, many options and we need to uh, be able to go through decision making and choose or influence others through the point of view that we hold. And many companies and many relationships don't get beyond level one or level two. And we know in companies that are highly political and in, very big in silos, people get stuck in level two, they uh, become addicted to being right, and they get into tell, sell, yell patterns which aren't effective for the health of the organization. That's why as I uh, did my research for so many years and started to look at the levels and the dynamics, I called them interaction dynamics from the very beginning, I realized that level three is the one that human beings were designed to move into, that we were evolving to this, and that's the transformational level where we're not only focusing on what we know, but we're able to ask questions and explore and discover what we don't know. And as you mentioned, the world is moving in such a fast-paced, uh, record-breaking speed now that being able to understand the world around us is so critical and generative and important to our success. And so when we see people interacting, if we see just a lot of telling and asking with an emphasis on tell, uh, which is what we see a lot, then we know that most people are operating that transactional level. If we see people advocating and inquiring, advocating their point of view, inquiring it into others, we know that we're in level two. And as human beings begin to notice something called sharing and discovering, which has a different kind of energy to it, it's where people are freer to open up and share what's on their mind, be transparent, uh, where they are in, uh, inquisitive and want to learn about another person, not just themselves, that's level three. And we know that that level taps the prefrontal cortex, which is the uh, part of the brain where um, our wisdom and insight and trust lives and it opens up human beings to grow with each other. 
it turns out that uh, there are things that threaten us from reaching level three um, and that these threats we pick up in a 0 0.07 seconds of our interaction with others. Um, one of the things is the tone of voice. So if we feel that someone is being judgmental, it will cause us to move back and not feel comfortable to open up. If we feel that what they're saying is hurting us in some way, minimizing us, making us feel bad or being judged, we'll pull back and we can't get up to that higher prefrontal cortex level. Um, if we feel like we're taking risk and we're scared, or we feel that we're going to be rejected, again, we're not going to be able to move up to that level three. Uh, if we feel excluded, if we feel that somebody's angry at us, if they're taking away our territory and minimizing the power that we have, or specifically uh, influence our status and make us feel like they are much more important than we, that part of our brain that manages what we need to do to protect gets very activated, and those kinds of threats will close us down. Does that make sense so far? Absolutely, and, and the territory one I found particularly interesting because we know that biologically speaking at least heart disease is caused by threats to territory, so this is where the work and place environment has a real impact on physical health in a very direct huge. way. Huge. What you said is so huge. I'm so glad you brought it up and I really do think that the more we understand the biological, biochemical, and uh, psychological and neuropsychological impacts of these things that seem so simple, as m the more we understand it, the more the importance of shaping the environment to minimize threats um, and activate our ability to access the, the great powers that human beings were designed for. Um, so letting people know where they stand is vital because a lot of the things on the right are things that make me wonder whether I can trust you. And if, I, if you tell me and I believe that you have my back, then that makes all the difference in the world and how I'm willing to open up. So the picture of the brain that uh, I like to show that helps explain this is that the lower part of the brain is the amygdala. It's very primitive. And this is where fear and the distrust networks uh, originate. And cortisol is the chemistry or the, the neurochemistry that closes down the brain. It actually sends messages to the prefrontal cortex saying, don't, don't share, don't share. And you can see environments that are full of fear, power, dynamics, uncertainty, people espousing being right, or the, even the phenomena of groupthink where we, we huddle and start to think like one person and not express ourselves. That's all the fear uh, neurochemistry and networking that's closing down our brain. Where the part of the brain that we need to be able to open up and where trust lives, believe it or not, these are trust networks or in the prefrontal cortex and heart connection. Um, when we have more transparency and are open and feel we can trust somebody. Where people, we focus on relationships before tasks, we, I, the, the word understanding is so beautiful because it means to stand under the same view of reality where we get to know what each other is thinking enough to merge our views of reality and then focus on shared success instead of my own success um, and tell the truth when we have gaps in reality. That kind of behavior that lives in a culture brings out, and you can see the word trust is being spelled by those words, those are the foundational, um, most important requirements for an environment to feel safe and for people to feel that they can trust each other. Um, and what happens is that without realizing that human beings make mistakes and some of those mistakes are we ignore others perspectives and don't realize we're doing it, it's focusing so much on our own, we form that tell cell yell syndrome or addicted to being right, we become a disengaged listener where we go in our head and try to process by thinking the thoughts that come to us as we're listening and the other person feels it because of the energetic connections that we have with others, or we allow our emotions to affect our listening and we uh, react in um, protective ways. We fight, flight, free, or appease others. So um, what these are called are the eye-centric protect behaviors, and uh, we can get trapped in level one, level two, uh, and stay locked in that tell, sell, yell, or addicted to being right, and more, more cortisol gets activated, and cortisol has a shelf life of 26 hours if it's produced in us, which means it doesn't go away when the action that caused it stops. It has a generative effect and it continues to beat inside of us and sometimes amplify depending on how we think about what just happened or the conversations that we have that follow what just uh, happened. Here's a picture of the do you have a question? Well, just a comment. Um, it's funny, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day who, who had something go badly wrong at work, and it was like three days later, and she's still processing the experience. And so that, that little bit of detail on, on the cortisol and how long it stays in your system is really important because it says if you've got a bad experience, it lingers. 
and yep. it's, it's very hard to clear and um, you can't just kind of mentally get over it as many people would say you know they, they, they you get that kind of advice it's not about getting over it it's about recognizing there is a neurochemical thing going on there that you have to address differently that's right and that's why doing things like meditating or taking a run or changing your physical space or um, eating less sugar and eating more of something that's healthy for you those are the kind of things that start to interrupt the power of cortisol but when it's wrapped inside of ideas and thoughts and worries and fears it really starts to own your brain and you become the, uh, the it becomes the master and you become the slave um, so what I did is I took 10 questions that looked at the kind of things that cause us to have either cortisol or, or oxytocin um, and I got uh, a couple 2,000 people took this assessment and this is what showed up which is really fascinating um, the bars on the left are the green ones which show more of a oxytocin response and the ones on the right are those that show more of a cortisol response. So your first comment could be, well, my goodness, um, you know, it shows that people do more of the green things, according to this chart. It's a frequency chart. And less of the red things, which sounds great. But based on what we just said, the red, which is the cortisol, has a 26-hour shelf life. So while it looks like the, the events themselves happened less often, um, the impact was greater. We also know that uncertainty, um, when you have, on one case, do you trust other people's intentions or are you open to having difficult conversations? If you're not open to having difficult conversations, even though you might say that you trust them a little bit more, those are counterbalancing forces. And so it creates more uncertainty in our brain. Um, while things are wanting to open us up, the power times 26, those bars that are red times 26, is the power that those bars have on us. Um, and we talked about some of them. We get distracted from listening uh, in our brain. We're not listening. Um, we're not really focusing on uh, other people's interests. We're trying to focus on convincing them of ours. And so those behaviors happen, even though they happen less, the impact is longer. So conversational intelligence um, has built into it a dashboard so that people can learn to visualize and see the impact they're having on each other. As we connect with another human being, we're either in an I state or a we state, or we're moving from I to we as we go through level one, two, and three. We learn to connect more, to trust each other, to open up our brains, to share what's on our minds. Many times we'll, imp we'll interact with someone, we say they're resisting our ideas, they're not interested, or they're very skeptical, or I can't win them over, or they don't seem to be interested in what I have to say. We need to learn to watch our interactions. We need to watch when human beings fall into protect behavior. So while we think we have an intention to say something, we need to learn how to watch the impact so that we can understand how to gauge what's going on and adjust our conversations so that we can pull people towards us, not push them away. Make sense? Absolutely, and as you're speaking, I'm thinking of the number of times, because I've been professionally facilitating for decades, uh, I've been in sessions with skeptics. Mm -hmm. and. And the skeptics are often people that have a lot to offer, but yep. it's just packaged up in a bad experience. And so yep. there's a lot of negativity there. And, and, but, but it's not to ignore the skeptics, it's just to find out what is it that they've learned from their experience and, and then helping them move toward a higher trust thing. It's, I think that's a role that we can all play is to, is to support the shift from that place of either being wounded or, or just a reason for low trust to yep. a place of higher trust. We could stay on this, this slide and have this conversation for another couple of hours because this is the heart of it. Just oh. what you said, our first reaction when somebody doesn't agree with us or they don't believe us, they don't, they'll say something, I don't think that's really going to work. And our first reaction is to go into, let me tell you why it is. Yeah. And that's level two. And when that happens and we stay in level two because we'll say, well, let me tell you this way or, you know, you don't believe this, well, let me tell you this. And so you're constantly giving them more reasons um, why you think it's right that's going to move them back to resistor. That's not going to pull them over to be a co-creator with you. Yeah, and this is, as a dashboard, this is fantastic because you can work with, you know, you can easily work with, I know you have done this, but you can put this in a room with, with a group of people and, and they can literally watch themselves shift across this spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, quite ha you know, just in their languaging. Exactly. So I have actually had this made up into a big poster. Many times we'll bring it in or put it up on the uh, a big... Um, uh, media projection screen and ask people where are you on the gauge when I'm starting to sense that there's some resistance and then I'll ask them the question what's it going to take for you to move to the next level um, on the gauge or on the dashboard and people actually are willing to speak about it it gives them a language to help them 
help you, the person they're speaking with, engage with them in a better way. And so, you know, this alone, this visual speaks to how the brain is organized and how our dynamics are organized. It's quite, quite magical. Um, Very powerful. Yeah, so that's where the cortisol comes, that's where the oxytocin gets delivered, and people actually love being co-creators. We actually enjoy tremendously experimenting without fear of risk. And so any organization going through change needs to have something, they need to have a conversational dashboard up, they need to talk about what's going to help people get to co-creator, open the conversation for that to happen, and people start to come on board. There's a willingness to do it. And when it's not working, people are willing to call out and say, I fell back to resistor. What you just said didn't help me. And then you process it. So it's, it's, it's a great way to help people move forward together. Um, trust is one of the most important things, as you know. And um, by the way, if we take the letter S and put it in front of the T, it spells strut. And too many people go into conversations, and when they're triggered, they start to strut their stuff. And in fact, if you move that to the bottom, to the end, uh, and trust emerges, it, it galvanizes a team of even people that are having difficulty with each other. Um, the practices that raise influence are being open to influence in the first place, listening to connect, not to reject or to judge, asking questions for which you have no answers, that's the discovery uh, part of the uh, level three conversations, prime for trust, which means starting out being the one to open the kimono or extend the uh, olive branch so that people feel comfortable with you, and sustaining conversational agility. That's refocusing, reframing, and redirecting so when the conversation gets stuck, instead of allowing your emotions to take over, think about this is like uh, moving the conversation from California to New York, lifting up the conversation from a place where it's not taking hold and moving it to another place on the conversational map where you can have a better way to frame up the conversation. And those skills are invaluable skills. Agility, they're connected to agility, which is the most important skill set for the 21st century. And conversational agility skills are probably the most important within the conversational set. So these are what we call we-centric behaviors instead of I-centric. This activates more oxytocin, helping people bond in a very natural, easy way. Um, what we need to learn also is that some conversations activate us as fast as 0 .07 seconds. That's the first impression or where trust is lost or your voice is lost. And the other side isn't very much, uh, much different when 0.1 second, uh, a judgment can be made, conclusions are made, decisions are made, and listening goes inward every 12 to 18 seconds. So the, the world of conversational intelligence has a lot to teach us about how to engage with others. And most of all, we know that we don't usually remember what people said or what they did. However, we do remember how they made us feel, that wonderful Maya Angelou quote in honor of her. Um, unfortunately, she passed away a month or so ago. So this is what the story is. Well, thank you. That's, uh, that's awesome. It's funny, you know, I've been asked uh, recently to put some together stories as I'm putting my own presentation together on, uh, to, to activate wider change in corporations and, and their thinking. And and uh, I was asked, uh, what you know, has anybody ever been angry at you, and, and if so, what for? And every single memory I went through on anger, I could not come up with why what they said. I could not come up with why they said it. All I can remember is is just that verbal lashing. That <laughs> I thought, well, well, that was effective. So the tell, sell, <laughs> yell approach. Um, yeah. The yell mm -hmm. portion of it just pretty much erases everything you were trying to tell, you know, in, in terms of its effect. And, uh, yep, exactly. Uh, pretty interesting in terms of, of um, <laughs> just in terms of results. Yep. Uh, I want to give you back. There you go. You're back, back on. Okay. Yeah. We can see cool. you now. So cool. thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate the, you know, the depth you've gone into on this. Uh, where do people go for your book and to learn more because there obviously is a lot more and it's certainly to go from one place to the other there's there's a mastery arc uh, yep. that goes with it some some you know if you're starting at level one you know you've got you know certainly or, or the team of you know you've been jumping around between level one and level two mm -hmm. you know you want to really change uh, how do people learn more to develop that that capacity and skill set so I get letters from people all over the world, from India, from China, from you name it, Argentina, um, Africa, and so forth, and they're sharing stories with me about what they're doing with the book. So it, if somebody is willing to go out and get a copy, 
uh, and you're a coach, for example, um, I have clients that are actually buying one for themselves and one for a coaching client and asking the client to read the first chapter or two first where it talks about your worst conversation and your best and begin to say what is it that, that represents me? How do I see myself in this book? And then how do I see others in the book? Because it starts the ability to ingest this and take the new language and frame it into your everyday life. And I think once people do that, and that's what I'm learning, I'm getting stories about not, not even people in our field and business, but even people that are just saying in my family, I, I stopped telling my son what to do because of this book. And for the first time, my son hugged me in the last, he hasn't hugged me in 10 years. And, you know, I, those are the kind of stories. It's quite heart warming. So for those people that are in coaching or in consulting and they want to try this, read it and then get somebody else that you're working with, like a peer coach or, or our client, have them read it and have them talk with you about it. And all of a sudden the frameworks will become so comfortable that you start to see the world through the dashboard or you start to see the world through the levels. And then the world opens up. My clients have said to me, my brain shifted. Once I got these frameworks, my brain actually shifted and I saw the world differently. It made sense. It's like all the, the weeds were pulled away and I could clearly say, oh, we're stuck in level two. That Don't label the people bad. We're stuck in level two. Move them, reframe, refocus, and redirect them into level three. And then, boom, it opens up again. Yeah. So that's how I would suggest. It's, uh, if you, my website is, is www.conversationalintelligence.com is where you can go to take a look at more, more things. But go to Amazon and, and pick it up. And um, I, I, just, I would love to hear stories that you're going to get from the people that you know. And I hope you'll share them with me because they are extraordinarily wonderful. So. No, abs absolutely. And I also know that we've got an awful lot of change agents internal to companies who are looking for ways to bridge that gap between the top level and the middle levels and the bottom levels. And, and this seems like a very powerful way to go about doing it. So um, I also encourage anybody watching the program, if you've got questions, uh, just fire them to me or on Twitter at, at uh, EP Donna, D A W N A underscore Jones, uh, or you can connect to, to me through the website and uh, we'll do our best to, I'll, I'll ferry them back and forth with Judith or, or we'll just find a way to do a Google Hangout and answer some questions live so that um, it'd be just fun to play and learn how we can do this together, how we can make a difference together. That'd so be great. Terrific. Absolutely Judith, wonderful. Thanks for being on the program, Judith. Thank you so much, Donna. Thank you so much. And thanks to all the people that have watched this. Um, look forward to running the next session. We'll, we'll see you soon.